message is brought to you by Ven Moody and the Worship Center Christian Church, where we are committed to honoring God, unifying communities, and building people. We hope you enjoy this message, and thank you for supporting our ministry. Who is God really? Uh, that's the first section uh, of the book. It's called, Who is God Really? Because I really believe that what we need now more than ever is a clear understanding of the heart of the Father. And that's, that's was, that was my burden in writing Desire by God. That's been my burden in sharing this message. I really believe that we're at a critical time in our world and I really believe that Jesus is the answer for the world today. Uh, that song I used to sing as a kid, Above Him There Is No Other, Jesus Is The Way. I, I really do believe that, but I do believe that in order for people to understand and connect with this hope, they first have to be able to understand who he is and see him clearly. And I believe that it's the responsibility of the church to communicate that. I believe that um, no matter how crazy and... Um, strange things have become in the world, I do believe that this is the church's finest hour. And so there's a, a lot of my deep conviction uh, of God about why this message is so timely. And so for the last several weeks, that's what we've been doing. And we are in our Desired by God shirts this morning because we are bringing this series to a close. And I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. Our uh, theme verse for much of this series has been Hebrews 8 and 6. Uh, we've been looking at it every week, and so some of you probably already know it by heart. This has been the foundational verse of this series. Hebrews 8 and 6 literally says, But in fact, the ministry that Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established upon better promises." This is just by way of a quick review. We've been looking at for the last several weeks something very, very important that Hebrews 8 and 6 is teaching us. It teaches us, first of all, that the way we relate to God um, through Jesus Christ is different than the way that others throughout biblical history connected and related to God. In fact, it says that, that the covenant uh, of which Jesus established is much better or superior, the NIV says, than the covenants of old. Uh, the New King James or the King James says that Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry founded upon better promises. And we've been looking at that for the last several weeks because part of the reason that many people misunderstand God and particularly his actions in the Bible is because they don't understand that God behaved in accordance with with the covenants that he had entered into with man at that particular time. And so we have taken the last several weeks, and we've been walking through this. We studied the covenant that God made with Noah, which was what kind of covenant? A grant covenant. Amen. You guys are ready this morning. We looked at the covenant that God entered into with Abraham, which is a grant covenant. We looked at what God tried to offer the children of Israel um, through Moses and uh, with Joshua, and they reject a grant covenant. They enter into a kinship covenant. We looked at the fact that that's exactly what the Ten Commandments are. That kinship covenant is then later downgraded to a vassal covenant under Joshua's leadership. But then we saw with David that in a, the middle of a vassal covenant era, God rolls back a vassal covenant, allows David to have a grant covenant with him. And then on last week, we came all the way to Jesus. And we recognize that through Jesus Christ, still in Hebrews 8 and 6, we are restored to an original grant covenant. So we looked at what God originally intended that we saw with Noah and Abraham and David and what we now have with Jesus Christ. And that's what we ended on last week, that the first thing that is said about Jesus in the New Testament, Hebrews 8 and 6 calls it the new covenant, 
is that Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David, which means that he is the fulfillment of the covenant God made with David, the fulfillment of the covenant God made with Abraham. So grant covenant, grant covenant. And what do we have with Jesus Christ now? A grant covenant. This is what the New Testament is all about. It is about the fact that now through Jesus Christ, the way we relate to God is a grant covenant. But it also means, and we looked at this last week, that this Mosaic covenant, this covenant under Moses, this system of all these laws has come to an end with the covenant relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And we spend a lot of time looking at this because this is a part of where the confusion lies in the body of Christ with many believers. And this is also part of the problem that I really believe the church is having today with us spreading the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in essence, many people have one foot in Jesus. Well, we celebrate, oh man, God loved us so much that he sent his son, but then we have another foot in these, this covenant of Moses where we still make people f jump through all of these hoops and fulfill all of these laws. And what we have been doing systematically over the weeks is we've literally been studying the Word of God because I wanted you to see for yourself, Scripture by Scripture, precept upon precept, truth upon truth, that that is not the will of God as it relates to who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, I do understand that if you were like me, meaning you grew up in a, in a law-based environment, I do understand that what I've been teaching you over the last several weeks has probably stripped you of a lot of things that you held dear because you grew up that way. I shared even on last week that that was for a large part of my journey. That's, that's a part of how I grew up. I thought that if I just crossed every T and dotted every I and did everything following the law, that that would be what it took to please God. But I told you about how the more I grew in the word, the more I realized how wrong I was. And so I know that this teaching raises some important questions for some of you. And that's what we're going to deal with this morning as we close out this series. I know for some of you, the question is, OK, so now you're telling me that we don't we, we don't get God's approval. We don't relate to God through all of these laws because I grew up pastor in an environment where I couldn't wear this and I, and I couldn't uh, have on a certain thing or I had to do this or I had to do that. And now you've just removed all of that from me. So the, the question now is then how shall we live? That's what we're going to deal with this morning as we close this Desire by God series. How then shall we live? If, if, if the law era under Moses is over, if we are restored to a grant covenant through Jesus Christ, how then shall we live? That's the question we're going to tackle this morning. I want you to meet me in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. And here's where we're going to start. And, and like previous weeks, I want you to uh, open up your TWC app, follow along with us, um, get something to write with or write, write on. Because like last week and in previous weeks, we're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning because I want you to be able to have a full understanding of this so that then you in turn can share it with others. Amen. Want, want you to know that you are desired by God so that then you can share with others who think, well, I made too many mistakes or, or, or God's not pleased with me. I want you to be able to articulate to them that they also are desired by God. So 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says this, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered for you. He is your what? Example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, no threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. Key that I want you to understand is that Peter says he's our example. One translation says he's our example in all things. 
How then shall we live? You got to start with the example of Jesus Christ because he is our example. So in light of everything that you've been sharing, Pastor, and if you, let me pause here and say this, if you've missed any part of this series, I want to encourage you not only to get the book, but to go back, go out to our YouTube page, go back and, and, and rewatch some of the teaching because I want you to get it all and not just in pieces. But, but if we're going to understand then, in light of this reality that we now have with God through Jesus Christ, how are we supposed to live? Well, Peter says, well, first of all, you have to follow the example that's set by Christ. Well, what is that example? How does it impact the way we're supposed to live? Well, number one, it means this. It means we live not for, but from his love. This is really important. It means, number one, that, that we don't live for, but we live from his love, talking, talking about God. When Jesus appeared on the scene, and I began to share this with you on last week in a small way, when Jesus appeared on the scene, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, were still bound and they were still living under all of the stifling rules that came into play under the covenant that God had with Noah, I mean with uh, Moses and with Joshua. So this is how the children of Israel are living. They're living by virtue of all of these laws. And so their relationship with God was based on a lot of work. And, and when it's about a lot of work and because of all of these laws, a failure to keep all of those laws what was inevitable. There, there was no way that any human being could keep all of those laws. Not only were there the Ten Commandments, but then the leaders of the nation of Israel by way of the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they had taken the Ten Commandments and subdivided them into 313 laws. And then you had the book of the law, which we talked about, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So you had law after law after law. So these laws were not only difficult to learn, they were difficult to keep, which meant that failure was inevitable. Nobody was going to keep all of those laws. And you see when you read, particularly from Exodus 19 on, how the children of Israel failed over and over and over again. That was the, the scene when Jesus started his earthly ministry. And similarly, many of us who grew up in that kind of environment, when, when, when it is heavily law-based, you get this sense that God is some big mean man in the sky that, that he, he loves to just to, to judge you and he's waiting behind every wall to jump out and catch you in something and to point out and say, see, you, you didn't keep my laws. But, but when you are living by way of this law-based system, what you must understand, number one, is that you cannot keep all the laws, but more important than that, that system is old. We looked last week in, in Galatians that said, that, that it's, it's gone away. We don't, we don't need that anymore in Jesus. So the point is, when you try to live by the law, it never works. It never works. And I want to I show you a chart, if they can put it up on the screen, that, that really shows how when you try to live by the law, there is, there is this cycle that, that never works. When you try to live by the law, there are several problems. And I'll, I'll read it. It's, it's a little kind of blurry, uh, but I want to read it to you. First, it's performance-based, number one. And so it's performance-based, meaning when you try to live by the law, you feel like you got to perform. You have to live up to the expectations of the law or you're going to be punished. And it creates this feeling that, man, if I don't get it right, God's going to judge me. So, so what we end up doing then is we end up playing this role. We know that we have fallen short, but we end up pretending and playing a role like, like we have because in a sense we feel like God is twisting our arm. And then you move from number one performance-based to being a fear of punishment. If, if I don't do this, I know I'm going to be punished. So I, I got to do it because, because I don't want to be punished. I don't want God to, to strike me. I don't want God to, to curse me. So we move from performance-based to fear of punishment. And then guess what? Number three at the bottom is a sense of inadequacy. Because you recognize that, but wait a minute, I, I can try and I can try and I can try, but I'll never be good enough 
to fulfill these laws to the letter. So then you move from a sense of inadequacy then to frustration. Well, what's the point? I can't do it. I'll never get it right. I'll never be good enough. And what it, what it leads a lot of people to do is ultimately to just give up. Instead of drawing closer to God, there are a lot of people that end up going further and further away from God because you know what they feel like? I'll never be good enough. I'll never get it right. But here's what you've got to understand. Jesus' death and his resurrection on the cross, right? His death on the cross, his resurrection on the third day, it removed the penalty and the punishment for not living up to the law. He took on himself all of our sins, all of our failures on the cross, and he removed the penalty and the punishment of not living up to the law. And that's why we now relate to God through a totally different way because of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is why it's called a a new covenant. Jesus ushered it in. And what is that new covenant? We no longer work for the love of God. We work from it. Let me say that again. We no longer work for it. We work from it. What do you mean we don't work for it? God already loves us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever sh- believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, Romans 5 and, and, and 8. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. Are you following me? Ephesians 1 and 6, that, that we have been accepted by God in the beloved. Who is the beloved? Jesus Christ. So this notion that I've got to perform, that I've got to jump through all of the right hoops in order for God to love me has been removed in Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. We no longer work for God's love, but we work from it. What do you mean we work from it? We work from the demonstration of God's love in Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. And so based on God's acceptance and and his love for us through Jesus, our lives should be lived differently. I want to make sure you get this. Y'all following me? We don't work for it, but we work from it. Let me show you this chart again. And this is a different chart. So this is what it looks like then when you work from the love of God instead of working for the love of God. Number one, you start with acceptance. I don't know why it's still blurry, but number one, you start with acceptance. Acceptance is, well, I know that by virtue of Jesus Christ, I know that based on grace that God loves me, that that I am accepted by God, that he's no longer up in the sky mad at me. And when he looks down upon me, he doesn't see my failures and my faults. He sees that I am covered by the shed blood of Jesus. So you start there, I'm accepted. And I hope you understand how radical that is. It means you you don't have to gain any more weight. You don't have to lose any more weight. You don't have to fix your hair a certain way. You don't have to do any of that for God to love you. Literally, by virtue of Jesus, God is saying, you and I are fine. And then you move from acceptance, number one, to security. I am secure. Why? Because of who I am in Christ. This is why the Bible over and over and over again talks about in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. Cut off from him, we can do nothing, but if we abide in him, everything about who we are is in Christ. And and because of that, we, we are secure. So then, after security, number three, at the bottom of the chart, we move to authentic relationship. So now, because I'm accepted and because I'm secure, I'm living out of relationship. I'm not living out of impossible works. I can have an authentic relationship, watch this, because I know that God loves me, the flawed, messed up me. When I pray, I don't have to put on airs and and say, well, God, you know. No, no, God God already knows. God knows I'm torn from the flow up, and I can go to him and, and, and be real and say, God, here's where I am, and to know that he loves me just the same. That's authentic relationship. I don't have to put on a mask. I don't have to put on airs. I don't have to jump through hoops. And then number four, it leads you to peace. 
as I settle into this deep and lasting sense of fulfillment, I know that I'm loved and it creates a whole level of peace. I'm no longer worried or anxious. Oh man, if I do this, will God love me? What do you mean? He already loves you. There's nothing you could do to make him love you more. There's nothing you could do to make him love you less. So we work then not for God's love, but we work from it. This is why in John 14 and 15, I told you I'm going to show you a lot of scripture because I want you to understand this. John 14 and 15, Jesus says, if you love me, comma, keep my commands. This is really important. Because what the law says is keep the commands, keep the commands, keep the commands, keep the commands. The law jumps over this if you love me part. And what the law tries to do is the law tries to just twist your arm. You better do this or else. But how many of you know that when somebody twists your arm, it's not real and it's not lasting? But Jesus says, if you love me, comma, then you'll keep my commands. Meaning that, that if you have embraced the love of God. If you've allowed his love to fully envelop your life, to, to, to really impact your heart, then you live from that place. It's kind of like uh, the question I often ask people, what side of the comma are you on? Because if you're trying to live on the side of the comma, well, I'm just trying to keep the commands because I don't want God to punish me, then that's not going to last and it's not real. But if you really open your heart to how much God loves you, yes, the real you, that radical love will reset your heart and you will live from that place. What I do for my wife and, and my children, I don't do because they're twisting my arm. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I love them so much. It's the same principle. That's what God is after. He's not after, well, you know, the Lord says I need to tithe. I don't really want to, but I better. No, 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 no. God wants you to say, but man, I, I, I know that everything I have is, is from him anyway. And man, he loved me enough to provide this opportunity when I didn't have anything. And so it is only right that I give him 10% because really the whole 100% belongs to him. And I am so thankful for, for the mere fact that he's done this for me, that it is an honor honor to be able to come back and give something back to him. That is living from his love, not living for it. Scriptures like Romans 2 and 4 that says that it's the love of God or the kindness of God that leads you towards repentance. When you really understand that, God, I can't believe that you do love a, a, a messed up individual like me, that you've favored a messed up individual like me, it, it makes you so value that authentic relationship that we were just talking about, that, that you live in a way that I don't want to do anything to damage that relationship. <sighs> My children know that whatever they do, I'm going to love them. They, they know that. They, they, they didn't have to work for my love. They came out of my wife's womb, and, and I fell in love with them. But, but they still, even though they know that, they still look over at me to, to see that I'm pleased. Ethan, Ethan had a football game yesterday and, and a flag football game and ran a couple of touchdowns. And one, one touchdown, I was on the, uh, uh, on the edge of the field kind of towards the end zone. And he, he, he got the ball and he hit the corner and just took off and they couldn't catch him. And, and he was coming close to the end zone and he was just looking at me the whole time. He was looking at me like, you see that? And I was like, yes. But him scoring that touchdown didn't make me love him anymore. I already loved him. But when he was running it, he was looking over saying, but dad, do you see me? Like, I want to make you proud. That, that's the difference. We're not living for God's approval. We're living from it. God, I, 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 wanna, I want you to be pleased with how I handle my marriage. I, I want you to be pleased with how I handle the resources that you've given me. It's like running into the end zone saying, Dad, do you see me? Yeah. Dad, Dad I'm, I'm, I'm on the job that you gave me, but do you see how I'm handling it? Yeah. That's what it means. In, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore... 
I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable uh, unto him. That is, you're pleasing, you're, you're acceptable. Uh, and one translation says, you're true and proper worship. Whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you've got to stop and pause and ask, what is the therefore there for? Because the previous 11 chapters of the book of Romans... What Paul is doing and he's, is he's literally saying, you can go back and look at it later. He's saying, this is what God did for us through Christ Jesus. This is what God did for us in Christ Jesus. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. This is what God did for us in Christ Jesus. And he continues that for 11 chapters. And then he gets to chapter 12 and says, therefore, in, in view of God's mercy, in light of everything God has done, this is what we ought to be doing. Meaning, we ought to live differently because of his love. You're not living for it. You're living from it. Are you following me? Number two, embody the balance. How then shall we live? Number two, embody the balance of his life. How then shall we live? Embody the balance of his life. What do do you mean the balance? This is where the church is. This is where many believers are. They're on one extreme or the other. One extreme over here is called legalism. That's, that's when it's all about the law. Oh, you did that wrong. Oh, you did that wrong. Oh, no, you know you're supposed to do that. And, and, and they keep score of everything you did wrong. That's legalism. You can't dress a certain way. You can't listen to a certain kind of music. You can't do this. 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 That's legalism. There's one extreme of the church, one extreme of believers that are over here. That if you come in one side of the sanctuary, you can't cross over to the other. I mean, legalism. Another another group of the church is on the other extreme, and that's license. License is, I also call it, sloppy grace. That's when people say, well, God loves you. He demonstrated it through Jesus. There's grace. So just live any other kind of way. Just live however you want to live. And we know that that's not right either. It's neither a right because when you look at Jesus, you don't see him on the side of legalism. You don't see Jesus on the side of license. Actually, you see him in the middle. You see him embodying love. Remember 1 Peter, he's our example in all things. Are you following me? So look at, the, look at the way that Jesus is described in John 1 and verse 14. John 1 and verse 14 says this, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, Begotten of the Father is the King James Version who came from the Father. Look at this. Full of what? Grace and what? It's not a true question. It's not. It's not a true question. Yeah, like, I'm not going to say it. You're going to say it. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after the other. For the law was given through who? Grace and truth came through. So, you don't see Jesus on the side of license. You don't see Jesus on the side of legalism. You see him as the embodiment of grace and truth. Truth and grace, not one or the other. Truth without grace is legalism. Grace without truth is license. I'm teaching better than you're responding. Let me say it another way. Truth without grace is abuse. Grace without truth is excuse. But you don't see Jesus with one or the other. You see him embodying both. John says, and we beheld his glory, talking about the birth of Jesus, full 
of grace and truth. Look at, look at Mark 2 in verse 13. It says, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake and a large crowd came to him and he began to teach. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Let me pause here because we're going to come back to this in a second. Tax collectors were cheaters. Tax collectors were scoundrels in this particular day and time. Because the way the tax collectors made their money was that they had to charge people more than they really owed the government in taxes because the tax collector took their fee off the top. So it says that he's walking by. And he sees Levi, tax collector, and he says, follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They're like, we don't get this. He knows these people are wrong. He knows these people have broken every law. Why is he eating with them? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, I I want you, I'm taking you through these scriptures because I want you to, to encounter this. Not just because Pastor Van said it. I want you to see it in black and white because it's been here the whole time. The, 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 the law-keeping, legalistic people did not understand why Jesus spent so much time around folk they considered unworthy. Because when you live by the law, listen to me, all you do is disqualify people. Oh, well, you can't, no, no, because you didn't do that. No, you, you can't come. You can't stand on the stage because you didn't do this. Oh, no, you can't sing because you didn't do this. Or you can't lead because, because you didn't do that. that. That's what the law does. The law disqualifies. And so these teachers of the law, these Pharisees are saying, well, he can't be with them or he can't be with them. And they are disqualifying all of these people. But what they don't understand is that in Jesus' eyes, in the eyes of God, There are no outsiders. God doesn't play favorites and neither should we. But what they see with Jesus that they don't understand is they see grace and truth. Well, well, but what is grace? Grace is the forgiveness and the favor of God. Grace is... That, that all of your sins and all of your mistakes have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. And because of that forgiveness, you get the favor, the power. You, you get everything that God has had in his heart that he's wanted to give you. That up under the law, you were disqualified to receive. You really don't deserve it based on your behavior. But it's a free gift because of what Jesus did. It's the forgiveness and the favor of God. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So they see Jesus showing this amazing grace, but it's grace and truth. It is not one or the other. It's both. Are you following me? Oh, y'all kind of quiet on me today. Luke 7, verse 36. Let's let's read some more scripture so that you can see it. I put the 2 Corinthians 5.19 in your notes, and so if you're following along, it's there. That God is not holding your sins against you. That's the power of grace. It's the forgiveness and the favor of God. But look at this. Let's go to Luke 7. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He went to the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. And a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and pour perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, now if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. This woman is Mary Magdalene who used to be a prostitute. 
Watch this. Jesus answered him, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One of them, 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, well, who is this who, who even forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, there's a whole bunch that I can lean into, and we can start shouting right here. But, but, but wait a second. I, I don't want to do that because I don't want you to miss this. I want you to see the balance of grace and truth. The Pharisee, Simon, is thinking, well, if you really knew who this woman was, you wouldn't have even allowed her to get close to you. But then he tells this story about these two people who've had their debts forgiven. Why? Because grace is the forgiveness and the favor of God. He's saying, Simon, what you don't understand is that the reason she's behaving this way is because she had a big debt. She, she used to be a prostitute. She, she was living in a way that was so far from God's will for her, but I've come to tell her that she is forgiven. But then look at the balance. He doesn't ignore the truth. He doesn't skirt the issue. He says, woman, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. He says, we're not going to pretend like you never did anything wrong. But what I want you to know is that your past is your past, that God is not counting your sins against you, that no matter how bad you messed up, you are forgiven and are accepted by God. It's grace and truth. When you have one or the other, particularly what happens with the church is we are on the side of the truth. We are so legalistic that the very people who need Jesus the most, we prevent them from even getting to him. Because what we would have said is like Simon. Oh, no, she's a prostitute. She cannot come in. She can't serve on the dream team. She can't lead a small group. Don't you know what she used to do? No, do you understand that we now live under grace by virtue of Jesus Christ, not according to the law. I'm teaching better than you're responding. And I wish I had time I'd even unpack that, that Jesus was also trying to minister to Simon because he was trying to say too, Simon, you've also been forgiven, but you don't even recognize it. See, 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 one of the greatest mistakes that you can get into is when you judge other people because the mere fact that you think you are qualified to judge them suggests that you don't even know how flawed and messed up you are. But if you were really in touch with how flawed and messed up you are, your response wouldn't be, I'm trying to judge you. Your response would be, listen, I'm so glad that he's forgiven me and I want to introduce you to that same level of forgiveness I'm out of time. Let me hurry up. How then are we supposed to live? In light of everything you've been teaching us over these last several weeks, how then shall we live? Here's the last thing, number three. Follow his only law. Follow his only law. Can I take a few, a few more minutes? Th thank you. I know this, this series is ending today, and I'm trying to squeeze it all in. Follow his only law. In this new covenant, the reason I took you back and wanted you to see the covenant under Noah, the covenant under Abraham and Moses and Joshua and David is because I wanted you to understand that in Jesus, we are back to a grant covenant. And if you remember the grant covenant, all of the work is taken on by the greater party, which is God. God did the work through Jesus on the cross. So now under this new covenant, 
There's only one law. Jesus actually, guys, only had one law. Not like uh, the covenant of Moses where there were all of these laws. Jesus only had one law. And that one law is John 13 and verse 34. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And then he says, and by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What is the demarcation that you are a disciple? What is the indicator that you are a disciple? By how many tongues you speak, how great you sing, how many ministries you serve in? Absolutely not. He says, there's only one indication that you are my disciple. He says, it is by how you love one another. If you love others the way that I have loved you. I got three, three claps right there. What does this mean? It means, number one, you don't have to tell people that they're wrong. You know, I've discovered that most people already know that they're wrong. <laughs> you don't have to tell them. Even before they open their mouth to say something wrong, they know it's wrong. So you don't have to tell them, you know that was wrong right there. They already know it. The more powerful witness, listen to me, it's not when you tell people that they're wrong. You know, I just got to tell them because they were wrong. Somebody needed to tell them. No, they already knew they were wrong. The more powerful witness of, of you having a relationship with Jesus is not you telling them that they were wrong when they already knew it. The more powerful witness, watch this, is can you love them when they're wrong? Jesus says, Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. Oh, okay. I'm trying to hurry up. Y'all not helping me. Matthew 5 and verse 43, Matthew 5 and verse 43, he says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father who is in heaven. He causes his son to rise, uh, on, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you only greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? He's saying that there is, there is no demonstration that you know God if you can only love the folk who love you. I don't expect to get any amens right up in through here. Y'all said y'all were going to let me teach this. He says, but if you really want to demonstrate that you know God, that you're walking with the Father, that you are, you are really living by virtue of, of the love of Jesus, then you ought to be able to love those and relate to those who don't even love you. He says, if all you can do is love people who love you, he's like, the sinners can do that, the pagans can do that, worldly people can do that. That doesn't take the power of God. What takes the power of God is when somebody can stab you in the back and call you everything but a child of God, but you still love them and you still fall on your face and pray for them. And I'm not talking about get them, God. I'm talking about, Lord, I just want you to bless their family and bless. And I'm not talking about that, oh, well, I love you anyway kind of stuff. You know that, you know that, um, that statement of love that's dripping in resentment, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I love you too. No. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, gives us the description of what this kind of Christ-like love looks like. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I'm teaching better than you respond. Teach, Pastor Van. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This is the description of what it looks like to love like Jesus. He says, love others as I have loved you. Well, see, you just don't understand what they did five years ago. Well, no, you're keeping wrongs. You're keeping track. Christ says, love, love them the way that I loved you. And can I tell you, when you're dealing with somebody that is difficult and demeaning and ugly and wrong, and you show them this kind of love, man, it, the Holy Spirit will use that to impact their heart. And, and they may never say anything, but, but they're like, I, I just, I don't understand. How are they able to love me like this? And at some 
point along the journey, God uses that as a seed to bring them to Him. So what does this practically look like? I'm going to close with this. I'm going to give you some practical steps. Once again, I've been trying to just bring this series to a close. I want to give you some practical steps. What, is, what, is it, what does it look like to follow Jesus, His only law? Under the new covenant, the only law that we live by is the law of love. What does it practically look like? Give me some tangible steps, Pastor. I'm going to do it. Here it is. A, connect before you correct. Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6 says, Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Have you ever had food that's got too much salt in it? Anybody ever done that? What do you do when when you eat food that's got too much salt in it? You're like, ooh, I can't, mm, I can't, I can't, ooh, I can't, I can't take that. It's too salty. That's the way that people respond to us as believers when we come in with truth. You wrong. Let me tell you why you wrong. You were so wrong for that. You, you, they're like, ooh, I can't, I can't, I can't take that. It's too salty. He says, let your words be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Meaning the first step is you got to connect with people before you come in trying to correct them. The truth is, you know what? We all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. We all crave attention. And we appreciate it when people show interest in us. And so when you, when you lean into a person by, by, by connecting with them and caring for them, God will open the door for the correction to come. But if you're going in with correction, they will shut the door. Oh, I don't, and I don't want to hear that. No, thank you. I know it's okay. I don't want to go visit your church. No, that, no, thank you. No, thank you for the card that you gave out. This, this, uh, but I'll take it back. I'll pay for my own meal. God bless you. Jesus connected with people before he corrected them. I don't think you got it. Luke 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector. So he was the leader of cheaters. And he was wealthy. He had become wealthy by cheating other people. And he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay at your house today. Notice the connection. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So then they walk away. They go to Zacchaeus' house, and all the people saw this and began to mutter, wait a minute, he's gone to be a guest of a sinner. That's what they're saying. Jesus has gone to Zacchaeus' house. Like, wait a minute, he's gone to, he's hanging out with the, with the sinners. So he goes to Zacchaeus' house. They're having a meal, and it goes on and says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is son of Abraham. Because this man rather too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. So I want you to see this. Grace and truth. How did Zacchaeus get to the point where he repented? He got there because Jesus first connected with him. There never would have been Zacchaeus standing up saying, I I repent, I'm sorry, Uh, I'll pay back four times what I've cheated people. Salvation never would have come to Zacchaeus' house if Jesus first would have gone in trying to correct him. He first starts by connecting with him something as simple as, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to stay at your house tonight. I want to hang out with you tonight, Zacchaeus. Just... I want, to, I want to take interest in what you're doing. Tell me about yourself, Zacchaeus. Connection before there's correction. We want to do it the opposite way. We want to correct. I just got to keep it 100. No, keep it Jesus. 
We, we want to correct. And there is no connection. Here's the next thing. I'm trying to run. Keep your standards high, but your grace deep. This is so good. Keep, keep your standards high, but your grace deep. People assume that when you start talking about connecting with people before you correct them, that it means that you just, you, you just, well, you just accept anything. No, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you lower your standards. Jesus never lowered his standards. There's one occasion in Matthew 25, uh, Matthew 5, verse 27. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anybody who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus doesn't lower the standard. He raises it. And that one statement, he made adulterers out of almost everybody in the audience. He doesn't, he doesn't lower the standard. He raises it. But here's the point. He refused to condemn the people that fell short of it. This is so good. This is so good. Jesus didn't lower the standard. He raised it. But at the same time, people that fell below it, he didn't condemn them. Jesus didn't say things to make people feel good about themselves. He told the truth. The standard got higher, but grace got deeper. He told Peter on one occasion, get behind me, Satan. Because your mind is on the things of, of man and not the things of God. This is his, one of his, his lead disciples. The only one who was able to say, you are the son of God. He says, get behind me. He didn't lower the standard. He raises it, but his grace got deeper because later on, Peter came back. And he said, feed my sheep. Later on, Peter ended up standing up on the day of Pentecost and preaching so that thousands of people got saved. But if Jesus would have thrown him away... He never would have embraced his purpose and his destiny. Are you following me? Here's another one. I'm trying to hurry. See, accept people without approving their behavior. This is so good. Accept people without approving their behavior. People think, well, but see, pastor, if, if I do that, then I'm going to be telling them that their behavior is acceptable. No, you're not. How many of you have ever had that crazy uncle or crazy relative at Sunday dinner? Anybody ever had that? You know, I mean, and then you go home maybe and you got your kids in the car or something and you turn to your kids and you say, now listen, now what auntie so-and-so did or what uncle did, I don't ever want you to do that. Can we not be real up in here, up in here? I've had those kind of uncles and you turn to your kids like, now listen, your uncle is crazy. And don't, don't, don't you behave like that. God, yeah, man, y'all don't want to talk this morning. Okay. But as crazy as your uncle or your cousin them are, they're still your family. And you still allow them to come to the table, don't you? And they can talk crazy and you smile and say, <laughs> you don't lost your mind. Would you hand me that uh, potato salad? Oh, you said, no, Uncle, no, Uncle Johnny, you know we praying for you now. Hand me those mashed potatoes. As crazy as they are, they're still your family. That's the point. As much as sometimes we may not approve of their behavior, they're still a child of God. John 8 and 3. Then the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. I don't, you know, I don't have time to do it. How do you catch somebody in the act? I don't have time to do it. Where they were sounds like voyeurism. It sounds like a whole bunch of other stuff that is just as wrong. But they catch her in the act. And then they come to Jesus and bring her, and they say, in the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. I don't have time to teach you what he was doing. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Okay, so let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and rolled on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, and the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? One translation says, where are your accusers? 
Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Truth and grace. Grace and truth. He doesn't say, oh, what you were doing was fine. He doesn't approve of her behavior, but he does respect her. He does, he does accept her. He shows compassion, but he doesn't condemn. And it was his balance of grace and truth showing compassion without condemnation that gave her a way out of her sin. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? The moment you engage with a person just to be right is the moment you need to check your heart. Because the moment it is about, well, I got to get them straight, is the moment that you indict yourself and you're not straight. Jesus wrote on the ground and says, okay, here's what I want. Any one of y'all who are without sin, y'all stoner. He said, y'all were so busy trying to get her right that you wouldn't even recognize your own flaws. Arguing with somebody and condemning them, it's never won anybody to Jesus. Nobody's ever come to Jesus because they have been uh, judged and condemned and you're good for nothing and God hates you. Nobody's ever come to Jesus that way. What they're looking for is somebody that says, you know what? I know what it feels like to be in that place. And I'm not here to judge you, but I am here to tell you that I got out and so can you. I know a path to freedom, and you can take it if you like. But I love you, and so does God. This is so good. I'm going to close with this. Come on, musicians. I'm, I'm well over my time. I'm going to close with this, but I really struggled, y'all, trying to wrangle everything in. Here's the last piece. Be a witness. How, how do I practically live this one law? Be a witness. Acts 1 and 8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Notice this. Jesus never told us to be his judge. He never told us to be his jury. He said, be my witness. A, a witness has firsthand experience. A witness, a witness goes to the stand and says, I can, I can tell you what I've experienced firsthand. That, that he saved me. That he picked me up. That he forgave me. That he delivered me. That, that he didn't just give me a second chance. He gave me chance after chance after chance. That, that's what a witness does. He never said, be my judge. He never said, be my jury. He said, be my witnesses. What, what the world needs is for the church to be a witness. To, to be a witness in what we say, to be a witness in how we live, not to be judge, jury, and executioner. And I believe that if we can be witnesses, we won't be able to build buildings large enough for the people that are going to come to Jesus. I, I believe that if we can be witnesses, no matter how messed up society is, we are going to see a revival hit this land like never before. That there will be a wave, a tsunami of people running to Jesus saying, what must I do to be saved? I believe that God has sent you where he sent you, that he has dispatched you as a witness on assignment because there are people in your sphere of influence that are hurting, that are lost, that are discouraged, that are depressed, and they don't need somebody to say, I, I, I listen, I've seen how messed up you are, and let me just tell you, if you don't know, you are tore up from, they don't need that. They already know it. They need somebody to say, you know what? I've been in times in places in my life when I was messed up. And if you don't understand why I have joy in the midst of sadness or if you wonder why I can laugh in the midst of sorrow, it's because Jesus. 
He did this for me. He did that for me. I saw him firsthand turn my marriage around. I saw him firsthand turn my finances around. I saw him firsthand take, take, take an altered and a messed up life and restore it. And if he can do that for me, guess what? He can do it for you. this message. For more resources, visit the Worship Center CC.org and VanMoody.org. You will also find Van Moody on all social media platforms. Again, we thank you for your support.